Yeah, so make me, yeah, if you can make me co host. Um, are, are you guys, are you guys, says as a host right now, are you guys co host? Okay, yeah, if you could just invite me. So go to, um, it's just B A U L M A G A. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so let me join it and then um, wait till he gets here to set up. There's some other settings that I sent him to, like, you call participants on join because, like, if there's yeah, one join, you get me to yeah. set that up already. Or, uh, let, me, let me go see what I can do up there.
did 150 in the past, and now this seems to be smaller for some reason. Everything's fine. I just got to get what's. <laughs> You can take this chair. <coughs> Here's an extra chair. <laughs> Two extra chairs. Come here. This. There's one chair here, there's one chair. All right, so uh, did we get the sheets? Yes. How many? A hundred? I forgot to also ask for marker pens. How many do we have marker pens? Okay, everybody just pass these sheets around. I hope all of you have brought pens that you haven't become so technologically advanced that you don't bring pens anymore. Everyone gets one sheet. Now just pass it around, right? And if you're wondering what to do with that sheet, here's what you do in the very first class, every time. You start off by holding the sheet in the middle and folding it into two perfectly like so, right? And then, I guess you can see where I'm going. Anybody want to say what I'm doing next? Yeah, what is this? Is this the only type thing I'm going to be doing? I'm going to be folding it twice more, right? You want to build a tent. And so this inner one, the first one folds in like so, and the second one folds in like so. So that's easy, right? And now it's going to be form a nice tent that will support itself. And now I'm partially blind. If you don't believe me here, these are my glasses, right? And I can't see anything without it. So what this means is that you're going to write your name nice and big so that I can see it all the way from out here, even if you're sitting at the back of the class. And you're going to be writing your name on this tent and sticking it in on your desk so that I, you know, I know who you are. I have this nasty habit of calling people out by name. So by the end of the semester, either you're going to be friends or you're going to be traumatized. <laughs> One of these two. So. And write it, write it nice and big, right? And while you're writing that, I'm going to just start because we will run out of time really quickly first. Uh, can my TAs please stand up? Wear your hat, wear your hats. <laughs> so the guys with the hats, except this guy, I only have three hats, they are my TAs. We have about 20 of them. This is Karan, Samiran, this is Aprajit, and that's Abu. And we have several more. They'll be taking turns coming to class. These are the guys who are gonna be helping you with office hours and everything else. Now let's, without further ado, Apparently my subscription has expired, okay. So by now, you must have seen a logistics post on Piazza because we have posted course logistics. If you haven't, then please take a look. If we, ha if we haven't posted, shame on us, we will do so. But I believe we have. Uh, we have also all been, hopefully been to the course website. That's how you know what this course is about. That's how you know, you know where you had to come for the class, right? Uh, and the course object is logistics, quiz and homework, quiz and homework policies, grading policies, all of these are on the course website. Please familiarize yourself with them. Uh, there's also a log uh, logistics lecture, what we call lecture zero. If you haven't watched it, please do, because that's going to tell you everything about how this course is run. The course is large, we have uh, the number of registrants kind of changes continuously in the first couple of weeks. 
But if I count everybody who is registered and who's on the waiting list, there are like 450 students in the class. So this means that'll shrink. But that's where we stand right now. That means that we don't really have time for every single one of you. Regardless of the staff size, regardless of the number of office hours, we depend on you guys to manage yourselves. We have about 23 or 24 TAs. Each of them is going to be doing a two or maybe three office hours every week, which is going to give you what? Uh, 75 office hours, divide that by 400, 400 people, uh, and uh, each of you is going to get maybe a couple of minutes per week, right? If everybody is there. So we really, really depend on you to manage yourselves. Which starts with watching the logistics lecture. You should have signed in on Piazza. You should have verified that you have access on Canvas and Autolab. If you haven't, please notify us on Piazza. We are very responsive. Uh, typically, our wait times on Piazza tend to be less than five minutes over the past many, many semesters. We pride ourselves on being prompt. So uh, you will get a response. You're going, there's going to be a note on forming study groups. Like I said, we depend on you kids to work with each other. And uh, you are going to be responsible for yourself more than we are going to be respons responsible for you, simply because uh, it's the only way it works. You don't learn from us. If you haven't figured this out in all your years in college, you should now. You learn from your friends. You learn from your peers. You learn from everybody around you. The class is basically just a place where, you know, it's, it's a placeholder where everybody gets to meet, and maybe I come and say a few things. So the way we facilitate, uh, we don't have the kind of cheating rules that other lectures and other courses do, because in my personal opinion, that's very counterproductive. You guys learn from each other. I want you to learn from each other. We want you to learn from each other. Cheating rules do apply. You cannot be submitting somebody else's work for as your own, because that means you have failed in learning, right? On the other hand, we want, to, want you to talk with your friends. So we're going to, we're going to uh, recommend that you form study groups. There's going to be a post where you will submit your study group so that we know who you are. Uh, every, there's going to be a TA assigned to every study group so that we can sort of track you and mentor you and make sure that everything, everything is on, uh, uh, going well with you guys. Work with your friends. Uh, uh, we also are going to facilitate additional work, additional uh, team work through uh, holding a hackathon every Saturday where you can come in, there's a big room, so you can come in and you can try to work with everybody else and try to solve the homeworks. Again, the policy is the final submission for a quiz, the final submission for a homework has to be yours. Every line of code has to be yours. But that, that's the limit. Beyond that, you're allowed to discuss everything, you're allowed to debug your friend's code, you're allowed to do anything else that helps each other because that's how you will learn, right? Exploit this policy. It's good for you, it's good for us, and you will learn. This is the last time that I'm going to be teaching this course all by myself. And uh, I don't even know how the course will be run the next semester, because uh, amongst other things, CIT is splitting off. But fortunately for us, Ashwin will be teaching the uh, CIT version of it. And if there's one thing I've learned over the past many years, he's a better teacher than I am. So those of you taking the CIT version of the course next semester are lucky. You're going to. Uh, you, we will be sharing material, we'll be sharing Piazza and everything else. So you actually, and who knows, you might get to decide which lecture you attend if both of us are teaching at the same time and uh, get twice the benefit. Now Ashwin's really sweet. He's actually shadowing this course. He's probably watching this lecture. He's going to be going through all of the assignments to make sure he's familiar with all the material. And uh, which means that the next time around, he's going to be more prepared than I am because I haven't finished the homeworks myself. Uh, uh, we have a no student left behind policy. In my ideal world, every one of you will get an A, right? In my ideal world, every one of you will earn that A. I don't just give out the A's. If there's one thing that you've learned about, if you've talked to your friends, they'll tell you this course is a killer. You, regardless of all of the policies we have trying to help you, about the amount of support we have for you, it's a lot of work. It's not, if you've seen the logistics post, there are several slides telling you it's not meant for chicken. So uh, this really means that uh, you have to put in the work, but if you do, we will do everything in our, in our uh, power to ensure that you have a better than fair chance of getting an A in the course. Just to give you the statistics, every semester, seven out of 10 students get some version of an A. 
So that we, this has been consistent through the past several semesters. Eight out of 10 students get a B or better. If you're, in the, if you're getting a C or worse, then you probably have not held up your end of the deal, because if you do, I promise you, you will at least get a B. We are going to use all the resources. We have TAs, we, have, we are setting up study groups. Collaboration, as I said, is uh, uh, encouraged. We're going to have more office hours than pretty much any other course in the, uh, in the, uh, on campus. If you need help, if you're in any kind of trouble, if you just are feeling overwhelmed, reach out to your TA mentors. Every study group will have a mentor. Reach out to me. Reach out to your classmates. Reach out to your friends. The one thing I don't want any of you to do during the semester is to get overstressed and begin dying of stress. That's not the point of coming to college. That's not the point of doing this course. The point is to learn. If you're getting overwhelmed, if you're getting stressed, talk to me. We'll figure a way out for you. So that's very important. Now, every Saturday, again, this is to help you. Uh, we find that if we, you guys overestimate yourselves. Most of you have probably signed up for more credits than you can handle. And you won't realize this until halfway through the semester when you're dying. And very often, it's going to be too late to drop courses, and you're beginning to uh, use your uh, drop coupons just in an attempt to try to cope. So uh, one of the things that we can do to help you is to help you manage time. If you procrastinate, if you put things off to the last minute, you will not get things done, particularly in this course where things just keep piling on, nothing stops for you. So every Saturday, we're going to have a three-hour period between 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock where we have a room where we are not Support, we are not working with you guys. This is a hackathon where you come in as with your study groups and maybe work together on working, that, working out the assignments or quizzes or whatever else. We will have some TAs there and possibly myself as well uh, just to monitor things. But then I highly encourage you to actually take advantage of this and come in and work with people because you can get a lot more done working together in that three hour period. And if you do that, then the number of hours you will spend per week on this class will go down exponentially, as opposed to if you go and sit alone at, at home and try to work things out and take breaks for coffee, which you will also count as your work time, although it is not. And uh, uh, you will end up spending 40 hours a week. Do it right. You can get this course done in 12 hours a week. So uh, that's also, the hackathon is also a great place to make friends, right? Now. Here are the course objectives. We want you to understand some of the theory behind neural networks. We want you to be able to build your own neural network toolkits, or at least have some idea of how to do so. And we want you to know how to work on large scale problems. So for the first point, we, need, we want you to know the what's, the why's, and the how's, the math behind uh, these models we'll look at, and so, some occasional history. And the one, learning the theoretical concepts will also help you contextualize what it means to build neural networks and what it means to work on large problems. And this is also probably going to help you, you know, extend and develop and extend your own ideas, which means it'll help you maybe uh, uh, work on research, apply to grad school, or answer questions in job interviews. The second aspect, we want you to have some idea of how to build your own toolkits from as close to scratch as possible. Now, pretty much everybody these days works on, uh, on standardized toolkits that you just download and run. And uh, things work just fine till something breaks, right? Or you find yourself in Antarctica and the tools are not available. So at that point, you're no longer a deep learning engineer. You're just a you know, helpless child. We don't want you to be that person. So we want you, the part ones of your homeworks are going to help teach you how to build your own toolkits if you're stuck on an island with a computer and nothing else. Uh, but the part twos also will teach you how to work on large scale problems. The problems that we give you are going to be somewhat close to state of art. The performances that we will expect from you are going to be state of art for these problems as well. You'll also be working on a course project which could relate to any of these three things. Now my lecture style is verbose. I'm going to say a lot of things, lots of pictures, some people like it, some people do not. 
if you are like, if you are fond of terse lectures where you know uh, we present a little math on the board and we spend a lot of time explaining, if you don't like these visual development of concepts and several people do not, then my lecture style is not the right one for you. You should find some other course because you're wasting your time in my class, right? Uh, but given a choice between deriving an equation symbolically and just showing you 200 pictures, I will always show you the 200 pictures. That's just my style. I'm going to use in-class polls to verify attendance. You're all expected to attend unless you have dispensation not to do so, which means you're in a horrible time zone like in Silicon Valley or you're sitting in Australia uh, or you have a conflicting course and you get graded for attendance. I've, we found over the semesters that people who come to class score more than those who don't. Even if you sit here and sleep in class, it turns out that's worth a point somewhere and that's gonna change your grade. So we do everything to encourage it. Every few minutes, you're gonna have a poll on Piazza and you're going to have to answer the polls, right? You must respond to all polls. If you have permission to not be in class, then you can, you're allowed to watch videos instead. And uh, you must watch this on media, media tech because media tech sort of logs who has watched the videos and who has not, and we will know. This is an interactive class. I expect you guys to talk to me. One of the policies we have is that there's no such thing as a silly or wrong question. Do not be embarrassed to ask anything. Do not be ashamed. Do not think that you're gonna make a fool of yourself. You will not. If you have not understood something, or if you think you're going to make a fool of yourself in asking some question, then the fact of the matter is that you are not the fool. I have done a bad job of explaining things to you. That is the perspective that you should always come to your questions from, which means it's okay for you to answer, ask questions. It's not okay for me to not answer the question. In the worst case, I may ask you to take it offline. Never be embarrassed, right? We're gonna try different tactics to encourage people to interact, which means we may just have assign numbers to you and ask, call up random people to answer questions. Be prepared, participate. This is a dumb classroom. And what this means is that your smart devices must be shut. So I'm going to wait. If you have not been paying attention, you've already flunked this class. Shut your smart devices. No laptops open, no phones, nothing, shut them. Right? Again, can, do you mind shutting your laptop? I will harass you, I will bully you, this is my style. If I find you uh, violating my rules, you're going to get called on. This is because if I permit you to open your laptop, one of you will, most of you are well-intentioned, some of you are not. Even those who are well-intentioned are eventually, I mean, this is the age of ADD. None of you has full attention, I promise you. 30 minutes into the class, you're gonna check your email. 40 minutes into the class, you're gonna go on Facebook. 45 minutes into the, into the class, you're gonna be laughing at some stupid joke somebody sent you. I don't care that you are disturbed. You are, you are losing out on the class. You're going to be disturbing everybody around you. If you want to watch Facebook, get the heck out of my classroom, go sit in, in the corridor, come back to that class if you feel like it. But not my classroom, right? Is that clear to everybody? There is one condition under which you're allowed to open your laptops. They're going to be, we have Piazza polls. When the polls come up, open your laptop, keep your, be ready with Piazza, go to the poll numbers, answer the polls. You're allowed to view lecture slides, but then I keep walking around the classroom. If I find that what you're looking at is not a lecture slide, I'm going to ask you to leave the classroom. You're allowed to take notes, okay? Finally, I'm physically handicapped. I have to say this because I have had complaints about me uh, to the admins and I don't like this. I have a neurological disorder. There are things I cannot do. I can't raise my arms. I will stumble in class. Sometimes I run out of breath. I can't point things. I have to use strange tools to point. I can't clip on the microphone on my own shirt. I have to ask somebody else to do it. If that offends you, don't come to class, okay? Then, questions? Any questions? Yes. Will the class slides be posted before the lectures? Yes, they should. The fact that they have not been posted today is actually uh, my fault. I was uh, setting up the hype, I was putting up the poll numbers and 
actually, I need a better picture than this. I was in Egypt till two days ago. I was going to put a, put a picture of the pyramids out here. And uh, I'm sloppy, so I'm behind. But today's lecture slides will be on, on, on uh, uh, the course page. And Wednesday's lecture slides will also be on the course page. And here's the thing. We will have a class on Friday. So Fridays are meant for recitations, except this week, because we have no class on Monday. And so we will have a recorded recitation for this week, which you don't have to attend, because obviously it's recorded. But I will be teaching on Friday. Please be here, right? So here's what we're going to cover. We're going to go through a brief history of neural networks about connectionism, early models, and their limitations. And we're going to introduce model, modern neural networks and what they can compute. Here's why you are in this classroom. Neural networks are taking over. They've become one of the main approaches to AI. They've been successfully applied to various pattern recognition, prediction, and analysis problems. And they have pretty much established the state of art in everything that they have been applied to so far. This wasn't always the case, right? So if you went back only to 2015, if you were using Siri, it was quite useless. Uh, it was more of you know, a, a party joke, trying to use Siri. And then in 2016, something magical happened. Microsoft had this paper in October 2016, where for the first time, an automatic speech recognition system outperformed human beings on a specific task. Now, mind you, we've been trying to perform speech recognition since the 1950s. It wasn't until 2016 that we managed to do something that actually achieve, you know, approach something usable. These days, your automatic speech recognition systems are generally better than human beings at performing recognition on the tasks that they're designed for. And that's because they use neural networks or machine translation. In October 2016, if you used Google Translate to translate English to French, and then used Google Translate to translate the translated French back to English, what went in and what came out never matched. And again, this, we used to use these to amuse ourselves. How funny can the outcome be? In October 2016, something strange happened. Suddenly, this became useful. It actually began working. These days, automatic machine translation systems are so good that even professional translators use those for the first cut. That happened because of neural, of neural networks. Or uh, object detection. This was something that Karan actually put through YOLO today morning. This is a very busy scene. And I think he actually, you, you might, did you take the photograph? But I'm not sure where the picture came from. But observe that the system has is segmented out and identified almost every object on the scene, the fire hydrants, the people, uh, their handbags, their backpacks, the traffic lights. It's pretty impressive. And this sort of performance was not even imaginable five years ago. Now this is expected. Thank you to neural networks. For the longest time, when people spoke of intelligent, artificial intelligence, the, uh, the base example they liked to use was ga were games like uh, chess. Now, chess is this crazy game which has no function in life, right? It's something that's purely in your brain. Human beings do it to, ent to entertain ourselves. And it's uh, an intellectual game. So it was assumed that if you had a good AI system that sort of was, was, that was intelligent in a human kind of way, it should be able to play chess and beat human beings. Now, in 1996, was it? This, or 80, 1980s, 90s? It became, uh, 80s, I forget. It became reality. For the first time, a chess game beat a grandmaster. And that was actually a chess game. Do you know where that first chess game was built? Anyone? So that was actually a PhD thesis in Wien Hall out here in CMU. And it was, didn't even start off as an attempt to build an automatic chess game. It started off as an attempt to build a little processor to do uh, search. And the application they used it for was chess. The next thing you, they knew was that they beat a, the, this PhD thesis beat a grandmaster. Then this person went off to IBM and polished it. And Deep Blue came out, which beat Gary Kasparov. And ever since, no human chess champion has managed to beat a computer. These days, the world's greatest champions can't beat the chess game on your 
iPhone. So that's how good it has become. Well, we had chess beat, right? But then there's this other game, Go, and Go is far more complex than chess. A chess game has like 10 raised to 120 states. Go has 10 raised to 180. So it's 10 raised to 60 times as complex as chess. And it was thought that for the longest time that machines are never going to be able to beat the best humans at chess. And then note the date again, 2016. That's the magical year in which all the change happened. AlphaGo beat the human champion Lee Sidol for the first time. It beat him so badly that the guy has stopped playing Go. <laughs> and then, I'm not joking, right? And then a couple of years later, you, you have these newer systems where the system starts from scratch without knowing the rules of the game. And then in a few hours, just by playing itself, it can become so good that it, it handily beats AlphaGo, which beat Lee Sedol. That's how good these things have become. Thank you to neural networks again. Or here's another thing. This, is, this too, I think, is from 2016. These are all images that have been captioned automatically by a uh, system. So a man in black shirt is playing a guitar. That's pretty perfect, right? Uh, construction worker, worker in orange safety vest is working on a road. Two young girls are playing with a Lego toy. Well, those are not young, two young girls maybe, but it got it mostly right. A boy is doing backflip on a wakeboard. I think that's about right. So it's very impressive. Now this sort of thing is being done by a system which has no clue about what it's talking about. The fact that this is possible is so impressive. And these days, of course, it's, it's much, much better, right? All of you have been playing with Dali. This is an example where somebody just typed a bowl of soup that looks like a monster made of, made of Play-Doh, and the computer drew this picture. Now, that's how good these systems have become. They can imagine, they can fantasize, they can create. They can do things that we thought were impossible sometimes ago. They've gotten so good that someone got fired from Google for claiming that AI has become sentient. So, but we close. Again, thank you to neural networks. All this has happened in five years. It's amazing. And it's used for a variety of other problems. Astronomy, healthcare, even predicting stock markets. So, what's in all of these boxes? In every one of these, just thinking of speaking of using something called a neural network. <coughs> But what are these neural networks? What are these boxes? In each case, you have this black box where something goes in and something comes out. If you're recognizing speech, a speech signal goes in, a voice transcription comes out. If you're, if you're captioning an image, an image goes in, a caption comes out. If you're playing games, the current game state goes in, a prediction for what to do next comes out. But those boxes are black, right? We don't know what's in them. So what, how can we sort of comprehend what must be in these boxes? For that, let's go back in history. We're going to go back 150 years. Actually, we're gonna go back 2,500 years. So all of these things we are speaking of, playing smart games, captioning images, painting, they're all basically human things, right? Human actions powered by the human brain. So let's begin by studying the brain or something even deeper, human cognition. So here are all the things. What do we mean by cognition? It's the process of thinking, right? It's the process of, uh, process of what? How do you define cognition? Nobody really knew, right? It's, it's, but here are all the things humans can do. We can learn, we can solve problems, you can recognize patterns, you can create you can just cogitate the craziest thing. Your best ideas come when you're sitting around doing nothing. You're having a shower, you solve some math problem, which you haven't, which is not even part of your homeworks, right? So you can actually come up, think up crazy new things when you're doing nothing at all. The act of cogitation, this is something that we can do. So given that our brains are so powerful, capable of all of these, if we want to perform all these human-like actions, maybe we begin by emulating this organ, right? But how do humans work? So to quote Marvin Minsky, if the brain was simple enough to be understood, we'd be too simple to understand it. So it's not really that you know, we can just figure out how the brain works, but we can try. And people have been trying for 2,000, 
at least 2,500 years. There have been formal theories for 2,500 years. The earliest model was by the by Aristotle, the earliest recorded model was by Aristotle and it was called associationism, which says humans learn through association. This was in 400 BC. Any of you recognize this picture? Anyone? It's a very famous one, yes. Which, what is it? Uh, it's just Plato and Socrates. Plato and Socrates, the painting, what's the painting called? Do you remember? Uh, uh, Athens. The School of Athens, right? It was painted by Raphael and it's supposed to re represent all of the great thinkers all the way to the 15th century. And in between, I think, that's Aristotle and that's, that's Aristotle, that's Socrates. I may be wrong. And a whole bunch of others, Diogenes and so on. Anyway, starting from then, people had this notion that the brain did its processing through the act of forming associations. And this was the model that stayed all the way till 1900 AD. You know, started with Plato, David Hume in the 1700s, Ivan Pavlov, everybody's familiar with Pavlov's uh, experiments with the dog. So what is associationism? Think of lightning. Lightning in your experience is generally followed by thunder. So if you observe lightning a few times, eventually you make an association between lightning and the thunder that follows. Then at some point, if you just heard thunder, your immediate inference is going to be lightning struck somewhere. If you observe lightning, you're going to brace yourself for thunder. So you form the association and you're making inferences from it. So the theory of associationism basically said that we form our, our process of forming inferences was based on associations that we learned from observation. And in fact, this model of associationism is the one that we still use in machine learning today. We just put math to it. But then going to the brain, here's this question. Where are these associations stored? And how do we store them? Because, you know, sure, maybe it's all about associations, but then it's got to be stored somewhere in your head and they have to be invoked in order to form your inferences. Where are these? Clearly it's in the brain. And with, the, uh, with advances in microscopy, we, we knew how the brain was constructed by the mid 1800s. We didn't actually coin the word neuron till the late 1800s, but we knew the brain was a structure of network cells. And that something about the structure had to do with how the brain worked. The first real, so here's what the brain looks like. It's got lots, lots and lots of neurons, cells which we call neurons, although they weren't termed neurons for a while yet. And each neuron connects out to many neurons. Each neuron is connected into by many neurons. And so in 1873, the first computational model for how this might work was proposed this, by this guy, Alexander Bain. He was like all of the scientists of those times. He was a polymath. He was a, a philosopher, a psychologist, a mathematician, a logician, a linguist, a professor. Being a professor is much harder in the 1870s than it is today. Today, pretty much anybody can be a professor, but back then it wasn't so easy. And he came up he, in his book, Mind and Body in 1873, he came up with the theory that the information that the brain stores is in the connections. And he actually came up with models for it. So he showed, for example, that just based on the connections, different inputs can result in different responses. So here's a network. It has three inputs and three outputs, but based on the input pattern, the diff different outputs will fire. So for example, if A and B are high, then X will fire. If A and C are high, Z will fire. If B and C are high, Y will fire. So different input patterns will result in different output patterns. Now this seems obvious to you. In 1873, it wasn't so obvious. He even showed how signals of different strengths can result in different responses. Here, for example, this gets three copies of the input, X gets two copies. So if the input has low potential, then only Y will fire, but if it's high, both of them will fire because two, of two copies must be, will be enough to make the neuron fire. So these are the first, oh, these are the earliest computational models. And these look very, you know, familiar, right? They look, they look like modern neural networks. 
This comes from 1873. It's 150 years old already. So the Bain's ideas on how these things form, they learn to form associations, to record associations, was uh, this. When two impressions concur or closely succeed one another, then the nerve currents find some bridge or place of continuity, better or worse, according to the abundance of nerve matter available for the transition. So it's a very complicated statement. It basically means predicts Hebbian learning that we will see in a few, few slides, but he even had a model for how the brain could learn its associations and learn these circuits. So this is a very advanced uh, uh, theory. And so the fact is that the neural networks that we are dealing with today were first proposed 150 years ago. Now, the problem was that, uh, you know, the fundamental problem of cause of the trouble is that in the modern world, the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. This is Bertrand Russell. This is basically what happened. So Bain postulated that there must be one million neurons and five billion connections between the neurons in the head to learn all of the various concepts of the brain for, in order to learn 200 concepts, 200 associations. But then by 1883, he did his math and he said, you know, associations just are not just born fully formed. They're going to build up. So it means there are lots of partially formed associations. And so the number of neurons you would require to learn all of those is going to be much larger than what you have out here. And eventually by 18, 1903, and so when Bain proposed this, everybody sort of uh, scoffed at him. And uh, he was the target of a lot of uh, attacks because they thought it was a very stupid idea. And by 1903, they managed to convince him. He sort of recanted. He said, yeah, this was a stupid idea. I'm sorry. You know, I apologize. And then he died. But uh, he was right the first time around, and he was wrong when he recanted. The human brain actually has something like 80 billion neurons, and it has something like, I don't know whether it's 10 or 100 trillion connections. More than enough to support everything that Bain thought was required with capacity to spare. And that's how it works. So the human brain is actually a connectionist machine where the information about associations is stored in the connections between the neurons. Neurons connect to other neurons. The processing capacities of the brain is a function of these connections. And so modern connectionist machines, your neural networks, actually emulate the structure. So this is what a connectionist machine looks like. It's a network of very simple processing elements. All world knowledge is stored in the connection between the elements. And this connectionist machine is different from the kind of uh, computer architecture that you have in your cell phones, for instance, instance, or your laptop, or pretty much any other modern computer. So does anybody know what this processor architecture is called? Yes? Von the von Neumann architecture. So what is the von Neumann architecture, James? Uh, we have the information and the data stored in one processing. Right, so that's the von Neumann architecture where, or the Harvard architecture, you have a processor and the memory is separate from the processor. There are different ideas. In the original von Neumann uh, architecture, you had a common memory for both programs and data. The so-called Princeton architecture has separate memory for programs and separate memory for data. And this is what it makes it so, so flexible, right? If you want your computer to do something else, you just change the data. You just change the program. It's very easy to load a new program and new data and make it do something new. The problem is with connectionist machines is that it doesn't have that kind of flexible architecture. The program and the data are in the connections. So which means the network is the, the, the processor is the program. If you want to change the program, you have to change the processor, which is why you don't really, very rarely, you very rarely, if at all, actually build neural network processors. You emulate connectionist machines on a Princeton machine, right? So a quick recap. Neural network-based AI has taken over most AI tasks. These originally began as computational models of the brain, or more generally, as models of cognition. The earliest model of cognition was associationism. 
the more recent model of the brain is connectionist. It's not merely associationism, but it's connectionist. That neurons connect to neurons and the workings of the brain are encoded in the connections between the neurons. And so current neural networks are connectionist machines. Now there are two polls on Piazza, just to keep, you know, this is my way of verifying that you guys are paying attention. Please get on your laptops. The poll numbers are posts 46 and 47, please attend them. You've got a minute. I think we've had enough time. Can anybody answer the first question? Who is the first person that proposed connectionism? Bain. Alexander Bain, right? How many connections exist between neurons and the brain? 100 trillion, 100 trillion last very large number. So that's why it's got all of the capacity that it does. And we haven't, we are, we haven't come anywhere close to building an artificial neural network of that size. So going back, here's the connectionist machine. It's a network of processing elements. All world knowledge is stored in the connection between the elements. But what are these individual elements themselves? For that, let's go back to the brain. Here are the individual neurons in the brain. This is what the neuron looks like. Roughly speaking, it's got this head called the soma, which has many little five tendrils coming out. These are the dendrites. That's where signals come into the neuron from. And then, uh, it has this long leg through which signals go out to other neurons. The long leg is protected by a sheet called the myelin sheath, with a sheath which is made of fat. If the collective signal coming in from all of, the, uh, uh, all of the input connections, the dendrites, exceeds some threshold, the neuron fires. And that, roughly speaking, and that signal goes down this long leg to other neurons. Now here's something, uh, uh, pretty interesting. Neurons don't undergo cell division. So uh, no neuron in your head is ever going to split. And there's a very simple biological process for reason for this. Can anybody, anybody tell me why? The brain doesn't expand. Yes. It's a sort of over the cancer. It's computational, right? How are we storing information? Through connections. What happens to a neuron if it splits? What happens to its connections, right? That becomes non, un, undefined. So you don't, neurons cannot split. Your structure will break down. But you do get neurons. Since you have new, something called neurogenesis that happens from stem cells, that's very, very slow. But once you're past you know, 18 months or something of age, you have got the rest of your life is one long life of decay of your brain, sorry. Anyway, uh, the other thing is that the brain, do you see this myelin sheath that protects the long leg of the, the axon? That is made of fat. And it turns out that the most important part of your brain is this fat. So the more fat you have in your brain, the better your brain functions. Quite literally, being a fat head is the biggest compliment anybody can give you. <laughs> They've actually studied uh, Einstein's brain. They found he had about the same number of neurons as everybody else in his head. He had a lot more fat. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we have this model of the neuron. Let's computationalize it. The first guys to do it were these two guys, Mekelo and Pitts. Mekelo was a professor in uh, the University of Chicago. Walter Pitts was a hobo who ended up at Mekelo's door one fine day. And then the two of them sat down, drank lots of whiskey, and came up with a model for the 
uh, neuron. Can anybody guess who's Meckler and who's Pitts? <laughs> right? Any, Jeff, you want to take a guess? Left is, right. well, so Pitts was like, uh, Walter Pitts was the hobo on the left. He was 20 years old when they did this work. And uh, he wasn't formally educated. He had run away from home. He used to spend his spare time corresponding with Bertrand Russell and such greats, and ended up at uh, Warren Meckler's uh, home. And they sat down and wrote this lovely paper called A Logical Calculus on the ideas imminent in, the, in nervous activity. And, uh, I have tried to read this paper. It's 100 years after the fact. I still cannot understand it. I've read it maybe 15 times. It's equally confusing the 15th time as it was the first time. But these guys wrote it you know, 80 years ago today. So here's the basic model for the neuron. A neuron is shown by this little triangle. It has two kinds of connections, excitatory connections and inhibitory connections. The neuron fires if the total number of excitatory inputs, where each of these connections is one input, it fires if the total number of excitatory inputs exceeds some threshold, unless there is an inhibitory signal which comes in through this inhibitory wire. That's the basic model. But then this can model all sorts of things. So to the left, for example, neuron one connects to neuron two through two connections. Neuron two is going to fire if it gets at least two inputs. Every time neuron one fires, neuron two is going to fire. So that's just a simple delay, the time taken for the signal to travel. The one to the right, if either neuron one or neuron two fire, neuron three is going to get two inputs, it's going to fire. So what is the Boolean operation there? That's an R. Can what, anybody tell me what the Boolean operation is to the bottom left? And. That's an AND. What about the one to the bottom right? So this is a little more complex. If one fires, three will fire unless two is firing because two is an inhibitory signal. So it's one and not two, right? So basically, once you can compose these gates, you can compose some very interesting structures. Here, they came up with a model which models uh, heat sensation. If you touch something cold very briefly, your instant sensation is typically of one of heat. You have to keep your finger on it for a while to actually make it get the sensation of cold. And they showed how you can model that with the structure. Here, this is a cold receptor. You have a heat receptor. You have the cold sensation and the heat sensation. If you very briefly touch the cold receptor, a, 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 a cold object, then an instant later, uh, this is going to, uh, that signal is going to go here. And one instant later, it's going to go here. Two instants later, this signal is going to go down here. But by that time, this signal is gone. So if your cold touch is very brief, the total input at the cold sensor is only one. You're never going to sense cold. But what happens up here? After two instants, this guy fires. And then that makes this guy fire. And you're going to actually get a sensation of heat if you have a very brief cold trigger. But if you have an extended cold trigger, then at time instant two, this continues to fire, so you get this signal. But it has gone here and come here. The first, the signal from at time instant one has taken the long route to the cold sensor, and so now you actually sense cold. But then at the heat receptor, this inhibitory signal is going to block this one. You don't sense heat. So they showed how you can, this kind of structure actually models the biological processes that we know to be true. Very, very nice. They sort of overclaim things. They claim that their network should be able to compute a small class of functions, that if a tape is provided to their networks, it becomes a Turing machine. This is true. Uh, can anybody tell me the relationship between a finite state machine and a Turing machine? How many of you are familiar with the concept of a Turing machine? Some of you, at least, right? So what's the relationship between a finite state machine and a Turing machine? Yeah. You need a tape, tape, right? So a Turing machine is basically a finite state machine with an infinite tape. So if you stuck a tape on Michelin and Pitt's uh, network, it becomes a Turing machine. It can compute anything that a Turing machine can compute. It's Turing complete. But they didn't really prove too many results, and they provided no way 
for the network to actually learn to perform computation. So they have a model for the brain, but they don't explain how the brain can learn to uh, perform the computations that it does. That came from this guy called Donald Hebb in his book called Organization of Behavior in 1949. And Donald Hebb was another interesting guy. Uh, he was also, there's something about being hobos like Walter Pitts, Donald Hebb. You know, people who start off their life as uh, homeless hobos tend to become famous, I think. Anyway, some of them. So this guy started off being a hobo. Then he decided he wanted to be a school teacher. Then all of that bored him. So he went to Harvard and became a, a psychologist and a neurophysician. So that's the sequence. You start off as a hobo, then you have to go to Harvard. <laughs> Things work. And so he came up with this very complicated sentence that I'm not even going to try to read because it'll, it's a tongue twister and it will confuse. But the basic idea, which he stated very, which can be stated very succinctly, is that neurons that fire together, wire together. What does, mean? what does this mean? Here's a picture. So let's say you have this neuronal connection. A neuron, in, at a neuronal connection, neurons don't actually physically come in contact with one another. One neuron has this head, and the other neuron has the surface, and the two are close to one another. When neuron A wants to signal neuron B, some signal comes down this into the head, which releases some chemicals, which goes on to act, activate neuron B. So now every time neuron A fires and neuron B responds, this head gets a little larger. So this makes it easier for the neuron A to trigger neuron B. If neuron A doesn't trigger neuron B, this doesn't happen, right? So what this means is that if two neurons fire together, their connection gets stronger. That's why they, that's where this whole business of neurons that fire together, wire together comes in from. I can write this as a mathematical formula. If I have a weight for a connection between neuron X and neuron Y, and the weight is currently W, X, Y, and then at some point you have X, which is the signal in neuron one, and Y, which is the resultant signal in neuron two. If both of them are one, meaning if neuron one excites, successfully excites neuron two. You want the weight to increase, right? And so that becomes WXY equals WXY plus eta times XY. Now, can any, anybody tell me if this is a, is a good learning rule? What could be wrong about this? Yeah, go ahead, Eric. It never goes down, it never goes down right? So this is a, th we actually still use the Hebbian learning rule. This is called the Hebbian learning rule. You're gonna encounter it again and again and again. It's a perfectly good model, but it is unstable, fundamentally unstable. What will happen is that over time, all connections eventually, just even from random inputs, they're gonna keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. They will all saturate. There's gonna be an unstable and uninformative model. So uh, just a simple continuous incrementing of the connection weights is not a very useful model, you need some way of decrementing it. And various additions were proposed even by Donald Hebb or by these guys called, uh, uh, by Sanger and uh, various others, something called Sanger's rule. But uh, Hebbian rule as in its basic form, while it makes sense, it has its issues, right? So let's go back and I'm going to ask you this guy, what would be a reasonable connection, correction to this one. Yes. Uh, That's a good one. But something even more? So if I gave you an idea of what, the, uh, what I want the response of Y to be, then if X results in the response Y that I need, do I need to increase the weight? It's already doing the job, right? When do I need to adjust the weight? When it's not resulting in the response that you wanted to respond, result in. So instead of making this proportional to x times y, you could make it proportional to x times the error. If there's no error, then there's no need to correct it, right? So that model, but before that, here's another point.
we'll get them on. It's a simple question. I think everybody should be done, right? It was a simple enough question. The poll is going to stay open so you can always respond, but let me continue, right? Anybody want to answer this question? Let me pick on somebody. Madan, what would be the answer to this one? Perfect, okay. So now that it's done, you guys shut your laptops, okay. Uh, now, so there's a better model. Because it's fundamentally unstable, we need an improvement. That improvement came from this guy, Frank uh, Rosenblatt. Oh, yes. I'll try to do that, thank you, all right? So uh, I need a mouse, I should actually have a mouse. Uh, Frank Rosen, the next advance, the next best model came from this guy called Frank Rosenblatt. Now, Frank Rosenblatt was a logician, a psychologist. He was at uh, uh, Yale and he invented the perceptron, which was called the solution to everything. Uh, here is the, did I, have I lost the slide? I hid the slide, it's unfortunate. But uh, let me check. Nope, I actually lost the slide. So when he came up with this model, uh, this was in 1958, it was heavily hyped. The uh, Tulsa Times in Oklahoma said, the Navy invents a computer that can think and recreate itself and stuff like that, very heavily hyped. What was this model? It was this one. Uh, as a simplified perceptron, where he said that the actual manner, he was trying to model the human eye, and uh, his idea was that you have a collection of sensors which have some fixed response at some first level units, and then you have a second level, second level response units which, get, which respond in turn to the uh, units at the first level, and that if all of these are architected just right, then this model can do anything. It can perform pretty much any computation if it's large enough. His theory was not wrong, but for any finite size machine, it wouldn't work. And Marvin Minsky and uh, Papert actually punched holes into some of the concepts that he came up with. And when uh, the uh, US government realized that this model was not really going to work after funding research in this for 10 years, they just stopped funding research in neural networks for a very long time. So. What was the model like? Look at one of the units. Like, let's look at one of the red units. What is that red unit? That red unit is what we will now call a perceptron. Uh, Frank Rosenblatt's original perceptron was his entire structure. But the individual perceptron, what we call the perceptron, is one of the units. It has the structure. It, has, it looks like a model for the human neuron. It has many inputs coming in. Associated with each input is a weight. So the total input of the neuron is a weighted sum of all of the inputs to the neuron. If this weighted sum exceeds a threshold, the neuron is going to fire and output a one, otherwise it's going to output a zero. This is threshold logic. Uh, those of you who are electrical engineers will recognize this as a threshold gate. How many of you have heard of the term th a threshold gate, right? This is a threshold gate, right? Very simple. So yeah. Uh, the, uh, here, here, here is the, uh, here's what uh, the uh, articles of the day said about the perceptron. They originally assumed that this could model any Boolean circuit, and they said an embryo of an electronic computer that the Navy expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. This is 1958. Uh, Frankenstein monster designed by the Navy, that thing, tools are Oklahoma times. And that little model below, does it look like anything like that? It really isn't. So, uh, this overhyping over cost funding for uh, the science show kind of stop. But then Frank Rosenblatt actually had a very nice insight into the whole uh, framework. And his contributions are amazing. So he showed, for example, that you can just change the learning rule to this new one, which is the concept that we just discussed. That instead of having the Hebbian learning rule, if you only updated the weight, by the error as opposed to the target output. Now something happens. If you're outputting a zero and, and you want to output a one instead, 
then you want to change a weight that goes in the negative direction. If you want to, if you're outputting a one and you're currently outputting a zero, you want to increase the weight. If you're not making an error, you don't change the weight at all, right? So the weight is now updated according to the uh, error that the unit is making. And he showed that this update rule will actually converge for linearly separable classes. We will see how this works in, in a later lecture. And the individual units themselves end up being very powerful. So here's what the individual units look like. You have uh, the unit here. Within the unit, I've actually put in the threshold. The total input must match the threshold. If it does, the unit will fire. So in this case, I have x with a weight 1, y with a weight 1. If both of them are 1, the total input is going to be 2, so it will fire. On the one to the right, the weight is minus 1. The threshold is 0. If x is 1, what happens? Will it fire? No. no. So what is that gate? That's a naught. And the one at the bottom? R. R. So clearly, the simple perceptron can model any Boolean gate, right? It can't model more complex functions like XOR. XORs are not possible. But even then, once you go there, you can go back and look at the brain again, right? You can see that uh, in the brain, it's, it's not like the brain is just a single unit. It's a network of units. And once you begin networking units, more complex functions become possible. And so even for this XOR, here's what you can do. I can have one unit over here, which computes X or Y, the other unit which computes not X or not Y, the third unit which ands the two, and now you have an XOR, right? So this is a network of units. You're only interested in this final output. The outputs of these individual guys are irrelevant, so you call them the hidden units because uh, they're just contributing to the final output, and then you have the output unit, which actually gives you the function that you want. And now, once you realize that you can compute an XOR, you know you can connect these things up to compute arbitrarily complicated functions. Like you have four inputs, and this network, with, which computes that really ugly function on top. So in cognitive terms, it means you can compute arbitrary Boolean functions over sensory inputs. We'll talk more about this in the next class. So the story so far, just extending what we saw, was that neural network models are connectionist machines that comprise networks of neural units. The Mekelo and Pitts model uh, represent neurons as Boolean threshold units. And they per model the brain as performing per prop what is called propositional logic, basically Boolean logic. Uh, Hebb's learning rule actually gave us a way for how you can learn these weights, but then it was unstable. And then Rosenblatt's perceptron was a variant of the Mekelo and Pitts model, which, had a which had, was, came with a learning rule, which was actually provably convergent for some class of problems. What I mean by provably convergent is that eventually you're going to learn weights that will actually solve the problem that you're trying to solve. But they are restricted in their capacity. Multi-layer perceptrons can model arbitrarily complex Boolean functions, right? But then here's the thing. Our brain is not Boolean. You're not getting binary inputs and producing binary outputs. You're getting continuous valued inputs, and you're making continuous valued predictions. But then let's take the simple case of getting continuous valued inputs and making Boolean predictions, yes or no, right? So for this, let's look at the perceptron again. Now the inputs x1 through xn are no longer Boolean. They are continuous valued. The perceptron itself doesn't change. So the perceptron is still going to produce an output of one if the weighted sum of inputs exceeds a threshold and it's going to output a zero otherwise. Now this, I can rewrite in this manner, right? That this unit first computes a weighted sum of inputs plus a bias, which is to say an affine function of the inputs. Does anybody know the difference between an affine function and a linear function? Anyone? Yeah, what is the difference? Origin. 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 So a linear function has the form summation i w i x i. So if I say summation i w i f i x i equal, if I equate it to zero, this is the equation of a hyperplane that goes through the origin, right? 
an affine function will have the form summation wr xi plus b. If I equate this to zero, this too is the equation for a hyperplane, but it no longer goes through origin, right? It doesn't have to go through origin. That's the basic difference between the two. And so you can say that I can recast this unit as first computing an affine function of the inputs and then putting this affine function through a threshold function. If this affine value is positive, the output is going to be one, otherwise the output is going to be zero. And then I can replace this threshold function out here by other kinds of functions. So everybody see how this comes up, right? I can replace this guy by other kinds of functions. Uh, I could replace this as maybe a sigmoid, right? Which would be said that I'm going to be computing an affine function of the inputs and then putting it through some kind of some other sigmoid function. A sigmoid is like a softer version of a threshold, or I can put it through even more complex functions, some whatever function, right? For now, I'm going to, so the thing is when you begin computing, putting the affine for value through some arbitrary functions, the output is no longer binary, it's continuous valued. But just for simplicity, I'm going to continue assuming that the output is binary, it's either zero or one, okay? So now, once you know how this works, you can see what the, func what the function looks like. This perceptron basically outputs a one when the weighted sum of the inputs and the bias exceeds a threshold and a zero otherwise. So there's this boundary where the weighted sum of the inputs exactly matches the threshold, right? On one side of the boundary, the output is one. On the other side of the boundary, the output is a zero. So if I were to plot this, if I had a two-dimensional input and if I were to plot this function, that's gonna be a heavy side step function. There's a linear boundary. On one side of the boundary, the output is zero. On the other side, the output is one. Right, do you mind sharing the laptop? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, All right? <laughs> so once you see how that works, you can see why it forms Boolean gates, right? If the input is Boolean, it's either zero or one, correct? If I have two inputs, the inputs can be one of these, the pair, input combinations can be one of these four blue dots. If my perceptron has this decision boundary, what Boolean gate does it model? The, this, that's a not, right? This is an and. Can you tell me why it cannot model an XR? It has to go up and then come back down, which this thing cannot do, right? So it can't model an XR. But now, once I know how to model a simple linear boundary, I can do crazier things. I can compose a network of these units, which give me a decision boundary of this kind, meaning I have inputs, I want the output to be one if the input is inside the pentagon and zero outside. How would I do it? Six perceptrons, like five for each side boundaries and then six. There you go, right? So I can have one perceptron, which outputs a one above this bottom line and zero outside. The second one would capture this boundary. The third one would capture this boundary. The fourth one would capture this boundary. There's only one and the fifth one would capture this boundary, right? Only within the pentagon do all five neurons output a one. Everywhere else, at least one of them outputs a zero. So now I can have a final neuron which just sums the outputs of all of the neurons and compares it to the threshold five. And now I have this network which models my pentagonal decision boundary. But then it gets interesting, right? If I can do a pentagon, I can do better. I can do a double pentagon. How do I do this? I have one subnet which captures, which outputs a one if it's inside the lower pentagon. I have another subnet which outputs a one if it's inside the upper pentagon. And then the final one ors the two outputs. So I can actually get a double pentagon. For those of you on Zoom, please pardon me for not pointing. I don't have a mouse, but from the next class, I will have a mouse. Right. And now, I can get more, more crazy decision boundaries, right? <laughs> How would I do this? Just chop it up into little polytopes and I can order them up, right? You can see this thing is very flexible, right? 
So now I can use this for performing classification. For example, if I'm looking at the images and I want to see if it's a digit two, then it, you know, it's some high dimensional image. Maybe it's a thousand dimensions because it's got a thousand pixels or whatever. But in that high dimensional space, there's some sub region inside which all instances of two occur. So all I need is to compose the network which captures this boundary and then I'm done, right? So MLPs, multi-layer perceptrons, are basically networks of perceptrons. I haven't explicitly introduced this terminology earlier. A uh, uh, XOR was a multi-layer perceptron because you had a layer of hidden neurons and then you had the output. But the more generic structures which have many layers of neurons like this guy, these are all multi-layer perceptrons. It's not just a single perceptron. You have networks of perceptrons, all of which connect up. And these guys can classify real valued inputs and give you pretty much any decision boundary that you want. So this, here's a poll. I'm sure you can answer the question. No. That's what I meant. So yeah. Uh, what is the answer? Seven. Seven, right? Easy. You don't really need a poll. So now we saw how a, a network of perceptrons can model any Boolean function. We saw how, how a network of perceptrons can model any classification boundary, right? But what about the other, what is the final case? Suppose I want to have real valued outputs, a function like this. How could I do this with networks of perceptrons? So to explain, we'll spend more time on this in the next class. Let's, we're going to first work, we're going to, so I'm going to explain this very easily with a scalar function of a scalar input, like you know, y equals sine of x. x is a scalar, y is a scalar. How can I model that using uh, a network of perceptrons? For that, we're going to begin first with this very simple circuit. It has a scalar input x, and it has two perceptrons. The first perceptron fires if the input exceeds the threshold t1. The second one fires if it exceeds the threshold t2. And I'm going to assume that T1 is less than T2. No loss of generality there, right? So what would happen? As the input increases, until it arrives at T1, both of them are going to output zero. So the output remains zero. When it exceeds T1, the first neuron fires, but the second one does not. And so you're going to get a one from here, but a zero from here, so the output becomes one. At T2, the second neuron also fires. So the first neuron fires with a one, it has a weight of one. The second neuron also produces outputs of one, but, it, but its weight is zero, it's minus one. When you sum the two, the output becomes zero, right? And so this little network is going to have a response of this kind. The output is one between T1 and T2 and zero elsewhere, right? Now suppose I ask you this question. I want to model this function which looks like this, and I give you this little network, how would you compose a network that models this function? Does anybody want to tell me? Perfect, right? I can just decompose it into many small rectangles. I can just sum the outputs up. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to be an approximation, but I can make the approximation as precise as you want. You give me an error, and I can construct a network that has smaller error than that. So what this means that is that an MLP with many units can model an arbitrary function over an input to arbitrary precision. And this actually generalizes to functions of many inputs as well. So
Now, this is a trick question. The activation is not a threshold activation. It's sinusoid, phi equals sinus A. James, can you answer this? I don't know. Uh, maybe three. <laughs> Anybody can want, want, want to answer this? You're going to need only one, right? The weight is three and the, and the bias is pi over two. Sine of 3x plus pi over two is cos of 3x. There you get it, right? So it will be none of the above. Uh, so, but yeah, again, the point is you have to think about what it's actually modeling. <laughs> so the story so far, is multi-layer perceptrons a connectionist? Yes. Wait, explain, explain that again. Uh, I can have, I have X, I have sine, right? So, and then I have a bias. If the bias is pi over two, the sine becomes a cos. Correct? And if this weight is three, you get three x plus cos of three x. Easy enough. So anyway, multi-layer perceptrons are connectionist computa uh, computational models. They are classification engines. They can identify classes and data. You can model arbitrary decision boundaries. Individual, you can think of individual perceptrons as feature detectors. I haven't actually gotten into this. I was going to spend time on this. Uh, the network will fire if the combination of the basic features that it detects exceeds a, uh, the uh, matches an acceptable pattern. There are slides missing. Skip this. The point is MLP can also model a continuous valued function. So uh, they are, we're coming to the last few minutes of class. We are kind of done. Please look at the complete set of slides, right? There are, I seem to have missed some things here. But here are all the other things we can see that, are, that a multi-layer perceptron can do. We saw that it can model pretty much any Boolean function, any decision boundary, any continuous valued function to arbitrary precision. If you add loops, then it can actually model memory and uh, uh, it can represent probability distributions over integer, real and complex valued domains. They can model a posteriori and a priori probability distributions of data. They can generate data from complicated or even unknown distributions and yeah. That last thing is just there because I like to be facetious once in a while. But anyway, you know they actually have competitions for this, rubbing your head and patting your stomach at the same time. And the guy who wins it is always Indian. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so anyway, uh, we are the most jobless people on the planet. Uh, so going back to our original question, the uh, Neural network, what was in those boxes? Every one of these boxes is a function, right? It takes an input and produces an output. What kind of operation takes an input and produces an output? That is a function, right? And the function could be Boolean. It could be taking in continuous valued inputs and producing categorical outputs, or it could be continuous valued. But in every single case, it's a function and we know that neural networks can model any function. So that's how neural networks actually plug into this whole theory. We are going to cast every one of these problems as a function problem, where you have some representation of the input going in, some representation of the input coming out. Our job will be to figure out how to compose a network that computes the function inside the box. And so interesting AI tasks are functions that can be modeled by the network. I'm going to stop right here, 9.54. I give you one minute to get to wherever you're going. I'll take questions.
कपड़ा बन गया स्टॉप द रिकॉर्डिंग स्टॉप द रिकॉर्डिंग